With Rosh Hashanah around the corner, there are two key concepts that are vital to get under our belts so we can not only appreciate the holiday, but to get what we need to get out of it. Because Rosh Hashanah at the end of the day is a, a holiday about judgment. It's a topic that no one feels comfortable with. That's the first concept I'd like to explore. What is, what is judgment? What's din? And the second is amuna, faith. And to give a quick definition of these two before pushing forward and then jumping into the Sogi and Gemara Shabbos, a uh, statement of Rava that really brings out, I think, um, what this holiday is about, uh, it's useful, again, to get a definition of, of din, which I think is the ability to translate social and ethical hierarchies. It's not just being able to interpret what's good or bad, but that's the most basic uh, of hierarchies. You know, what is good is above, what's most, most worthwhile, what's bad is below. But it's also about being able to interpret context, having different ethical values at play uh, competing for one another. So, for example, you know, murder, you know, murder is wrong. You know, that's 100% true in certain contexts except if you want to save your life, if someone's running after you. What's really cool about being able to interpret hierarchies is really good at it. There's an amazing researcher, Dr. James Pennebaker, who's discovered that we're able to nail our social position hierarchies within 30 seconds of meeting somebody. It's this ability to discriminate, to be able to tell the difference, to order our ethical lives and our social lives. That's, that's what a judgment is. This and not that. And having, having the ability to prioritize the value of what that is as opposed to this. A moon is interesting. I think a, a useful definition, something that I, I gleaned out of the Chazanisha Sefer, A Moonus Videos. The way he seems to describe Amuna is this built-in trait we all have. It's not necessarily, uh, by definition, connected to God at all. It's, it's this compass we have of, of, uh, that orients us in the world, that allows us, or that, that draws us into the world to be willing to be open and curious about it. Yeah, on a, in a biological level, this is probably the orienting reflex very similar, this exploratory desire that we have. What, 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 it's, what, what, the, what, the, what the feeling is, I think, ultimately, is this faith that the world has meaning. And it's that faith that drives us to look into everything. That assumption, this has meaning, this has value. And we can choose to put that on a Shem or something else. That's a, that's a step two you know, in a more religious way of looking at this term, but it's built into us on a fundamental level. So the goal of today's class is going to be to better explain what the concept of Eurus Hashem is, how to define it, what does it do, and, and what we're going to find as we go through this, this Sugi and Gemara Shabbos, uh, looking at the way Rava is, is uh, understanding what judgment is, well, we're going to see that his idea of Yeras Hashem is, is more tool-like than anything else. It, it transforms how Amuna and how Din manifest from us, how we express those values, and ultimately are able to, to better engage the world. As therapists, clinically, I think we are shooting to develop a sort of Yeras Hashem with our clients, to be able to regulate Amuna, to regulate Din, in such a way where we're able to give over the skill called radical acceptance. You know, it, it, radical acceptance as a, as a psychological skill to help clients incorporate, well, that's kind of like a judo move, where we're pulling in pain, we're engaging it, we're confronting it, we're not afraid to run away from it. That's exactly not what we're doing. But we're pulling it in, being curious, courageous in doing so. And by doing so, we, we escape suffering. So in, in 
behavior therapies like DBT and ACT. Radical acceptance is a key component in the emotion exposure therapy that's done there. DBT also uses radical acceptance as an emotion regulation skill. Uh, you can kind of think of that as an ejector seat when all other skills of being able to emotionally regulate uh, one's mood have failed. Well, this is a, this is a, a, a last-ditch effort to not completely lose control of one's life and make things worse. Radical acceptance is powerful. From a psychodynamic approach, you know, rad, uh, radical acceptance is definitely there, but there it's more the tone of the entire therapy, where the therapist himself is trying to model this curiousness, this openness to whatever is there, this willingness to lift up that which is denied, demonstrating bravery. Now these are these are these these whether from a behaviorist approach or a psychodynamic approach, they are different. I think that the behaviorist approach is slightly emphasizing the din aspect of being able to discriminate and judge one's world. Uh, so it's going to be more pain-centered uh, in the sense that we're trying to get a good sense of what's painful and what's suffering, what will, what will take us out of suffering, what will allow us to feel pain, and ultimately to transcend that pain. Whereas from a psychodynamic approach, I think that the emphasis is more on the curiousness part of things, the openness, the willing, the willing to explore. So like I said, a really good sogia that, uh, that can help us understand uh, what Din and Amuna are and ultimately have a better understanding of what Yeris Hashem is, is Gemar Shabbos, Daf Lamed Aleph, Ahmed Aleph, and it goes to Ahmed Beis. Sukiya starts with a with a chiddush from Reish Lakish. Reish Lakish is he's he's grappling with a pasuk from Yish, from Sefer Yeshayahu that says that the faith of your times is in your strength of salvation, wisdom, and knowledge. The fear of Hashem is his treasure. So kind of orienting ourselves in the pasuk a little bit when you look over in the Abarba now, well, he says that this whole section of Sefer Yisha, who is describing Geula, you know, the ultimate salvation the Jewish people are going to experience. And that these above qualities of the sort of salvation, wisdom, and knowledge, well, well, those are our possessions as the Jewish people. These are something that we've been, we've been given. They're, they're in our hands already. They'll be more um, uh, evident during the times of Gula, but as far as the possessions go, those are ours. And, and this is important because the latter half of the, of the, of the verse is describing that Yerus Hashem is something which is owned by Hashem. It's his treasure. Now, what's interesting, the way the Abarbanel describes this Pusik, and we're going to see this in the actual Gemara itself, is that Hashem's treasure, this, this Yerus Hashem, well, it, it, it's, it's being described as something that unlocks the world. It opens up the world in a different way. And it's something that is purely his, but we have access to, that we can use. So our Gemara and Gemara Shabbos opens up with Reish Lakish. Uh, he, he, he's trying to figure out, well, what's the symbolic meaning in each of these words in this verse? And the way that he... he organizes his understanding of this verse is that, well, each word, each aspect, each possession of the Jewish people, well, that's one part of Mishnayis. So ultimately, you know, the, the, the you know, time, salvation, wisdom, you know, all these, all these different uh, uh, key words in the, in the verse, well, they're representative of one aspect of Jewish law. That's ours. But he makes distinct the treasure of Hashem, this Yerus Hashem, that even if a person studied all of Halacha, knew every law cold, fear of Hashem is different. So he, he's ultimately making a distinction and an assertion. The first is that Halacha, information, for lack of a better conceptual term, is different than Yerus Hashem, which I, we can kind of think of as meaning. Knowledge and meaning are not the same. And that it's ultimately fear of Hashem that gives 
any value that gives meaning to halacha. And here Rachel Lakish ends. The next insight given is from Rava. And he, he's taking Rachel Lakish's point that there's, there is meaning and non-meaning that's in front of us, but that he pushes it one step further, that non-meaning, you know, without Yerush Hashem, well, it's not neutral. It's actually laced with suffering. So Rava teaches that you know, in the time of judgment, that when we pass away, we're brought in before this sort of you know, tribunal, I guess, one way of thinking about it, and we're asked several questions, trying to outline what our life was about. Now, the different Rishonim think about judgment you know, the times of judgment, uh, breaking them up into three different times. You know, one is Rosh Hashanah, that every year we, we have an accounting of what our life was about in the year. So it's all very present focused. Now, sure, there's this sort of reflective quality to it, but the idea is, you know, who are you now in your life? So that's, that's the present focused aspect. The next is at the end of one's life, which, which is where Rava is describing. And, and here, it's, well, what did you make your life about? More consequence-focused. The last judgment that we'll all have is in the end of days when, when all of creation has come to a completion. And the question is, well, well, how did your life matter in the greater scheme of things? There's this idea within Jewish thought that, well, we're not just judged for our intentions and actions, we're not just judged for the results of our actions, but the ripple effect it has through time. The good that's accumulated until the end of days, and the bad that's accumulated in the end of days. So that's the final judgment there. It's a more big picture judgment than anything else. But it doesn't matter what type of judgment, whether it's Rosh Hashanah or the end of days, it seems like from the way Rav is understanding things, that there's really seven criteria that we're judged under, no matter, no matter where you're holding one of those three. So we're, so we're brought before Hashem, and we're asked the following questions. Did you conduct your business faithfully with a Muna? Did you designate, did you set up specific times to learn Torah? Did you work at having kids and raising kids? Did you look for and expect salvation? Did you engage in, in the dialectics of wisdom, you know, iron manning two different ideas together, trying to search for truth, looking at opposites? And, and did you under, did you be able to make inferences in what you were learning and understanding? Were you at, meaning were you actively engaged in life, not just letting things happen to you, but there was an active participation in it? And now, just like Rach Lakish, Rava leaves off with the question, and despite all of these, these things, was there Yerush Hashem? Is this a quality a person had been able to develop? And if so, those six things have worth, and if not, they don't have worth. Now, at this point, it does seem that maybe there's this neutral ground. Well, if it doesn't have worth, but maybe it's not bad. It's just a loss. But Rava adds a parable. And he says that this whole, this whole situation, this, how the importance of your Hashem, is kind of like if you know, you're, the, you're, you're, you're the owner of a farm, and you have one of your farm hands haul up, haul up the harvest on top of your roof. It's going to be the upper, upper areas, in the attic, the guy pulls it up there, and you ask him, oh, wait a second, did you put in the preservatives to keep the worms out? And the servant says, oh, no, I, I forgot, I didn't, I didn't think you, you didn't tell me. And the, and the, the farm owner says, well, okay, well in, that, in that case, you know, it would have been better if you wouldn't have hauled those things up. So there's a couple different things that that are the outcome of this you know this is this is the bad this is the suffering this is this is the this is the negative aspect of not having your Hashem. because you imagine here the weed itself is going to go bad it's going to become infested with worms 
it itself is lost. But it's more than that. Again, thinking about this in the context of this being in the attic, those worms are falling through the cracks of the wood. This is getting, those worms are getting in your bed, they're getting in your food. You're going to have an infestation of your entire house on your hands, ruining not just your life, but anybody who comes near you, anyone who comes into your private life. So lack of Yerush Hashem is a bad thing. It takes these very intimate, very meaningful aspects of our life and ruins them and ends up hurting and ruining other people's lives. One, one way of thinking about this is from a moral, and, a moral and evolutionary psychologist perspective. If we were to look at the works of Jonathan Haidt, uh, you know, what, what he's demonstrated and, and other moral psychologists have shown is that there's two, there's two types of morality that exist uh, on a biological level. One, which is his area of, of research mostly, is disgust. Now, disgust is one of the six primary feelings that they uh, that that are that all people have. There's biological markers for these. There's uh, cognitive processes uh, for the feeling of disgust, and it cues different behavioral patterns. Disgust is this sort of you know people who have this sort of personality trait that engage the world in this more in this more disgusted way, well, they're very high in orderliness. The, the orderliness, which is fine, which is an okay thing, but it crosses over into a hyper-obsession with cleanliness and purity. There's a high rigidity with, with people with this temperament, a lot of black and white thinking, highly categorized thinking. The, the, the permeableness of the, the boundaries of categories is sealed shut. The lack of flexibility is another way of thinking of it. There's low openness and low agreeableness, and high neuroticism as well. So thinking about disgust, again, as being a, a primary building block of, of one way of being moral and ethical, well, this moral expression is seeking out to exterminate a threat. There's a contemptuousness, there's a scorn that a person is feeling. There's a, a high use also of a plausible deniability. Uh, this person is trying to hide the fact that they're contemptuous and scornful, but it's definitely there. Another, another uh, moral expression of this is an inflated ego complex. Well, the person is highly relating to their ego persona, their superman self, as opposed to who they really are. So there's also this detachment from reality. A second type of moral base, which again is, is, is present in all people, is this quality of awe. Now what's cool about disgust and awe is both are rooted in fear, but where for disgust, the, the type of fear that, that disgust is, uh, ultimately, like I said, motivates people to want to exterminate and destroy, well for awe, there's this type of openness to it. For awe, if you ever imagine being confronted with something so large that you just couldn't incorporate, you know, a beautiful vista, uh, an amazing song, there's this sense of inf being, being confronted with infinity, and you're trying to grapple with it, you're trying to integrate it into you. Ultimately, you can't, but it's it's, it's so gripping that it doesn't matter that you can't. You're still drawn to it despite the fact that it, it causes you fear. So, like, so again, there's this high level of openness, a low level of neuroticism with this experience. And it, 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 maybe another way of thinking about it is it shares qualities with vertigo, where your whole nervous system is overwhelmed with, with this feeling of too big, too dangerous. But with the, but, but being able to be in the zone of tolerance where it's something that you're still wanting to try and integrate, that you're willing to confront it, you're willing to be there. It's captivating. So the moral expression here of this type of, of experience of awe is being confronted with the infinite and you're hopelessly trying to integrate that fear into yourself, but that it's, it's transformative, it's transcendent. 
So there's courage, humility, and acceptance of what is. And there's this reduced importance in who you are as an individual. It's not as though you're giving up who you are, but you're, you're fitting into the grand scheme of things. And I think it's fair to say that both disgust and awe, they express Din, they express Amuna, but in very different ways. Where I think awe is at the heart of it, you're a Sashem. And disgust, what, what Rava is warning us from falling into, that all of those very meaningful, important uh, life domains that he listed off, well, you can live in those being disgusted, being rigid, being inflexible, but that ultimately it destroys you and those around you. So this amuna of disgust, sure you have this open and curiousness, but it's, it's not... It's not because there's a genuine interest in the world around you, but it's in order to find the threat and suppress it, destroy it. Sure, there's an energy to it, but it's a destructive energy. This is a moral indignation. The din of disgust. Well, there you have the shoulds and oughts that are being put on other people, mostly. Now, sure, these are also internally directed, but... It's those should and oughts are not things to live up to, but what they end up doing is eating away at your life. It's having this oppressive judge standing on your shoulder. You know, you're not a good enough parent. You're not learning enough. You know, you have to be more honest. And it runs you into the ground. And again, that 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 judgmental, critical eye being put on other people. You know, horrible parents. Why doesn't that guy learn more? There's a clear good guy and bad guy. Again, the hierarchy is very rigid. And there's the sense of control a person has. You know, I'm the boss. I know better. There's this assumption that, well, you're at the top of, you're at the top of this moral hierarchy. And sure, you're, you're hard on yourself, but you're hard on other people also. There's this top-down perspective. And describing engaging morality and ethics, halacha, in this way. It's easy to see how you could fall into those traps and, in all those life dom domains, wreak havoc on yourself and your relationships. All is different. This is the transcendent, transformative key that Reish Lakish was talking about and that Rav is spelling out in more detail. The, the amuna of awe Again, is this open and curiousness, but there's a courageousness, the self-assuredness that exists that one is willing to accept whatever life is throwing at you. Again, this idea of integration that will take that to yes and. And the din aspect of, of all, there are shoulds and ought tos, they exist there too but they're directed towards the whole. There's a greater good to live up to. And this greater good is a, is a greater good we're all striving to, to reach. And so there's this sense of, of, of connectedness and togetherness that, that all of humanity is, is traveling on the this, on this same road of shoulds and oughts to better themselves and better other people. And you find here this idea of submission, submitting to meaning and order. And that by submitting to this meaning, submitting to this order, submitting to pain, well, what you're doing is you're paradoxically transcending it. There's a suppressing aspect to one's ego here, which allows us to take on duty and responsibility as opposed to meeting requirements and criteria. There's less of a sense of measuring yourself as opposed to being bigger because it's the right thing to do. It's a call to greatness, ultimately, that we're climbing this moral, ethical ladder upwards. So it's a bottom-up perspective, as opposed to, with disgust, that top-down perspective. So you see, looking, looking at Yerush Hashem in this way, looking at Amuna this way, looking at Din this way, all combined, that really is radical acceptance. That is the skill we're trying to give over in our DBT skills group. 
that that is the skill we're trying to cultivate as an act therapist to to judo the suffering of life to find the the meaning that's the other side of that coin and it is that curiousness that openness that courage as a psychodynamic therapist willing to lift up what's in the shadows to bring that forward and confront it as being a part of yourself just as much as the parts of you that are already in the light. That we enable our clients to find meaning in their suffering so they can transcend it and escape it. Now, there's still going to be pain there. Life is filled with pain because what all pain is is a hierarchy from good to bad, moral to immoral. We can't escape that. That just is. But by developing this skill, this, this, this quality, this part of ourselves that does fear Hashem and really fears it, sees the awesomeness of Hashem, recognizing His greatness, but doing so in a, in a way where we're not opening ourselves to disgust, well, we become bigger. And the bigger we become, at a certain point, we, we become bigger than our pain. And it's at that point that our pain might even be useful, might even be meaningful, might make our lives something that we want to have, maybe even have a little more of pain. Because we can see, we can see the road we're walking down through it. Because we accept it. Again, it's that Judahoing suffering. So I give everybody a bracha that we should all be courageous this Rosh Hashanah to openly and curiously accept our pain, the pain that we cause other people, the pain we cause ourselves. And that by finding meaning in that, by looking at the other side of the coin, seeing how we want to live, seeing how we want to be bigger, that we can, we can be more and transcend with that pain.